I'm going to show you that building your own PC is really not all that difficult, and once you know what you're doing, it can actually be pretty fun. So let's get right into it. Before you can start building anything, you're going to need to do a little bit of shopping. I like to get all the hardware for my systems on Amazon because they pretty much have everything that I need in one place, and I can usually get it all delivered in like one business day with my Prime membership. So I'm going to put all kinds of links down in the description of this video that you can use to get all the hardware that you're going to need. The core system components of any PC are the motherboard, the CPU, and the RAM. When I'm planning a build, I like to start by selecting the CPU because that's going to determine the type of motherboard that's needed. For this build, I'm going to be using an AMD Ryzen 5 3600, which I think is a really great CPU. It offers a lot of performance for its price. This CPU requires a socket called AM4, so that means we need to look for a motherboard that supports socket AM4. So if we look at this motherboard, it's made by ASUS, it's called the Tough Gaming X570 Plus, and it has a socket AM4 for AMD Ryzen processors. I recommend 16 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM as the minimum spec for any system build these days. If you're doing basic computing and gaming, then you should be just fine with 16 gigabytes. But of course you can go up from there if you're doing heavier productivity tasks or video editing and stuff like that. This RAM kit is Corsair Vengeance LPX. It has two eight gigabyte sticks for 16 gigabytes total, and it runs at a speed of 3600 megahertz. We're gonna need some storage for our operating system, programs, and all sorts of other apps and data and stuff like that. You can use traditional hard drives for this, but if it fits within your budget, I recommend using solid state drives instead, just because they're much faster. We're gonna install a two and a half inch SATA SSD and an M.2 SSD into this build, so you'll be able to see how to work with both types of drives. If you're building your system specifically for gaming or 3D rendering or video editing, then you're gonna need a dedicated graphics card. This is an entry level card, it's the GeForce GTX 1650, but this is where you should be putting as much of your budget as possible if you're after high performance for gaming or productivity. Our components are going to need some power in order to work, and for that we have this 650 watt power supply from Corsair. This is a modular power supply, which means we get to choose which cables to install. And that's really good because it means we don't have just a mess of all sorts of cables that we may not need that we have to deal with and manage inside our build. Now you can't really have too much power with your power supply, but it is possible to have not enough. And that's not a good thing because it can cause uh, stability issues and all sorts of problems with your system. So if you're not sure what size power supply you need for your build, just go online and search for a free power supply calculator tool. There's all sorts of tools online where you can enter in the hardware configuration for your build and it'll tell you roughly what size power supply you should be looking at. And all of our hardware is gonna need some place to go. And for that, we have this Corsair Carbide Spec 5 Mid-Tower PC case. When picking a case for a system build, it's important to make sure that all your hardware is going to fit inside, and that's especially true for the motherboard mounting area. For this build, we're using an ATX motherboard, and this case is perfect for that, but it would also support smaller boards called micro ATX. I like to start my builds by getting the case ready. That way, when it's time to install hardware, there's no other prep work to do. This case has a clear side panel that requires a tool to remove. But most cases these days have some sort of thumb screws that'll allow you to remove the side panel without any tools at all. There's typically a little box inside the case somewhere that has all sorts of different screws and mounting hardware that you'll need for the build. On the opposite side, there's a solid panel, and this one just uses two thumb screws at the back, so it's really easy to remove. This is the area behind where we're gonna mount the motherboard, and we're gonna be running all our cables back here so they're not visible. And this is the main area where all our hardware is gonna go. And now I'm just gonna take the case and set it aside until we need it. Next, I'm going to get the motherboard unboxed and ready for the CPU and RAM installation. Motherboards come in some protective packaging that shields the sensitive electronics. If we flip the board over, you can see there's a metal plate back here. This is the back plate that supports the CPU cooler mounts. Since it doesn't have any electrical components, it's a safe area to touch. On the front of the board, there's some other non-electrical areas as well, like heat sinks and plastic covers. When handling the motherboard, you should always try to avoid touching the electrical surfaces to prevent any accidental damage. To remove the board, I'm going to carefully grip it by the cooler back plate and also the heat sinks on the front. And then I'm just going to close up the box and set the board right on top. The square looking thing with all the tiny holes is the CPU socket, and on either side there's some mounting brackets for different types of coolers. The area around the CPU socket is filled with all sorts of power regulation components. These sit under some aluminum heat sinks to help keep them running cool. These are called DIMM slots, and it's where we're going to install our DDR4 RAM modules, and this board supports up to four separate modules. These are PCI Express slots, and we'll be using one of these for our graphics card. These little pins down here control the power button, reset switch, and front panel LEDs. 
Over here we've got some USB headers and a serial port. This is an M.2 connector for SATA and NVMe SSDs, and there's another one down here under this heatsink as well. This is a 24 pin main power connector for the motherboard, and these are 8 plus 4 pin CPU power connectors. Let's get our CPU ready for installation. CPUs come in a little plastic protective case. If you take a close look, the metal part on the top of the CPU is known as the Integrated Heat Spreader, or IHS, and on the bottom, it's covered with all sorts of little pins that make the connection to the motherboard. These pins are super fragile and need to be handled with care. Intel CPUs work a little bit differently where all the little pins are actually inside the motherboard socket and the bottom of the CPU just has little contact surfaces. This makes the CPU a lot easier to handle or there's a lot less risk I guess you could say because you're less likely to bend one of those pins, but it does mean you have to be a little extra careful with the motherboard. When handling CPUs, try to avoid touching the IHS or the pins or connectors on the bottom. Basically, you want to grip onto that green substrate layer around the outside edge. We need to release the tension arm on the CPU socket to get it ready to accept our CPU. All you have to do is gently move it out from under the little notch on the socket and push it upward as far as it goes. If you look closely at the CPU socket, there will be a little triangle symbol in one of the corners, and that's to help get the CPU oriented correctly. Now if we look at our CPU, there'll be a little gold triangle in one of the corners, and actually there's another one on the top as well, but the one on the top's usually a lot smaller and not as easy to see. To get the CPU installed, all we have to do is line up the triangle on the CPU with the triangle on the socket, and then it should just effortlessly drop right into place. Next, let's get our RAM installed. This board has four RAM slots, and you'll notice that two are black and two are gray. Right next to these slots, there's a little legend that tells us how to install our RAM. B1 corresponds to the first slot, B2 to the second, A1 to the third, and A2 to the fourth. Now notice that B2 and A2 have a little star next to them. This is telling us that these are the slots that we need to use first. In this case, it's the gray slots on this board, but these could be blue, brown, red, or just all black. Every board's a little bit different. If we were installing four RAM modules and filling up all the slots, then this wouldn't really matter. But because we're only using two memory modules, it's important to make sure we're using the correct slots. If we take our RAM out of the box and look closely, we can see that the connection surface on the bottom is split or keyed, with one section being longer than the other. This means the RAM can only be installed one way, which means you can't really mess it up. We're going to open the clips on the ends of the slots that we need, and then line up our RAM's notched area with the spacer in the socket, and then we can just slide it in and press straight down until it clicks into place, and you should see the clips closed on the end. And then we'll just repeat the process for the second module. Let's get our M.2 drive installed next. There's an M.2 connector just below the CPU socket, and then I have another one on this board at the bottom beneath a metal heatsink. I'm going to install the drive into the location with the heatsink so that you can see how that works. First we need to remove the screws on either side, and then we can remove the heatsink and just set it aside for now. This is the connector that the drive fits into, and these four little silver posts are for mounting different sized drives. Each mount has a label printed next to it to let you know what kind of drive it's for. The most common size is 2280, and that's this one right here. If we take a look at our drive, we can see that it's notched or keyed, and the bottom one is a little bit shorter than the one on the top. And that little tab has to fit inside the corresponding section on the M.2 connector. So we can just hold on to the drive and slide it into the connector as far as it'll go. And it's normal for the drive to be sticking up when you first install it. It's actually the mounting screw that holds it down against the motherboard. Now if we look at the back of the heatsink, there's a little thermal pad on here that helps transfer heat from the drive. Always make sure you remove any coverings on the thermal pad before installation. Now all we have to do is place it on top of the drive and reinstall the two screws that we removed earlier. At this point, the motherboard has all the major hardware installed, with one exception being the video card, which we'll install a little bit later. Now we're going to get our power supply all set up with the cables and then get it installed in the case. Since this is a modular power supply, we need to install the cables ourselves. If you don't have a modular power supply, then all the cables will already be attached. For this modular power supply, we have a 24-pin main power connector that feeds the motherboard, two 8-pin connectors for the CPU, two 8-pin connectors for graphics cards, and some peripheral and SATA connectors. The 24-pin cables split into two different connectors on one end for connection to the power supply. Under that, we're going to insert two 8-pin CPU power cables, then a single 8-pin cable since that's all we need for our video card in this build, and finally we also need just one SATA power cable. SATA cables have long rectangular connectors with a little L-shaped notch on one end. Video card cables are usually 6-pin with an optional 2-pin connector for 8 total. CPU cables typically come in 8 and 4 pin banks. These two are 8 pin connectors that can be split into separate 4 pins for different power configurations. 
and this giant one is the main 24 pin power feed for the motherboard. When installing the power supply, make sure the intake fan is facing the ventilation area on the case, then carefully slide it into place and line it up with the back mounting plate. The power supply should come with its own set of mounting screws. Secure it to the back of the case with four screws in a cross pattern. Next, I like to get all the cables routed to the back side of the motherboard mounting area so that they're not in the way as we continue to build. This includes the cables for the front panel as well. Next, I'm going to install the I.O. shield. Some boards have this built in around the connectors, but this particular board doesn't. The shield just pops into place in the cutout area on the back of the case, and that's it. If you look inside the empty case, you'll notice a bunch of little steel posts for mounting the motherboard. It's very important that these posts align with the mounting holes on your motherboard. If there's one in the wrong position and it makes contact with the electrical surfaces on the board, that can cause a short. If you need to add or remove anything, you can easily do that. They just thread or screw into place. Once you've checked the mounts, go ahead and lower the motherboard into place and secure it with the appropriate screws. Now it's time to install the CPU cooler, and this part of the video might not necessarily align with what you're doing for your system build. And that's just because there's so many different types of coolers out there and so many different ways of mounting them that companies have come up with. Since this is a basic build that I'm doing, I'm gonna show you how to install the stock cooler that came with the CPU. But if you bought yourself an aftermarket cooler, the best I can say for this part is you're gonna need to follow the instructions that came with it or search online for tutorials or videos that might be able to help. To get our cooler installed, we need to remove the mounting brackets from the motherboard because this cooler just threads directly onto the motherboard backplate. This cooler has thermal paste pre-applied, so we'll just lower it right down onto the CPU and secure it with a Phillips screwdriver in a cross pattern to ensure we're applying nice even pressure all the way around. Then we can plug in the fan power cable to the CPU fan header on the motherboard. Now we can start managing and routing and plugging in all our different cables. This case has a few different cutouts and cable pass-through points. All I'm going to do is use the areas that generally line up with the connections on the other side. I'm going to start by plugging in the CPU power cables up at the top of the motherboard, and a lot of cases have their own pass-through ports right at the top, specifically for these kinds of cables, but unfortunately this one does not, so I just ran the cables along the top of the board. Next, I'm going to plug in the main 24-pin power cable to the motherboard, and also the front panel USB connector right next to it. Down in the bottom left corner, I plugged in the front panel audio connector, and the power LED, reset, and power switches need to be plugged into these little tiny connectors on the bottom right corner of the board. These little tiny connectors can be a little bit of a pain to work with, and there is some text labels printed right next to them that tell you what they're for, but the text is so small that it can be pretty hard to read. So there's an easy way around that. You can just flip open the motherboard manual that came with the board, and there's usually a diagram in there that's very clear on where your cables need to go to get your front panel stuff to work, like your power button reset switch and all that sort of stuff. Now I'm gonna install the two and a half inch SATA SSD. These drive cages that came with the case support 2.5 inch drives using the mounting points on the bottom, but they can also support 3.5 inch traditional hard drives by using the pegs on the sides. And if you're using those, you can actually just flex the cage and pop a 3.5 inch drive right in there without using any tools. For our 2.5 inch SSD, we just line it up with the mounting points and screw it in with four screws. Then we can just insert the cage and drive right back into its place inside the case. Around back, we can now connect the SATA data cable and the power connection as well. And then the other end of the data cable plugs right into an open SATA port on the motherboard. Now it's time to get the video card ready for installation. Notice the PCI Express connector is keyed and it'll only fit into the motherboard one way. This part of the video card has all the ports where you'll connect your monitor. This one has DVI, HDMI, and DisplayPort. And we also need to pay attention to this little power connector. We need to make sure we plug in a power cable here or the video card won't work. Start by removing the PCI Express covers on the back of the case that line up with the PCI Express slot on the board that you're gonna use. This card requires two slots, so I'm gonna need to remove two covers. Press down on the clip at the end of the PCI Express slot to open it, lower the graphics card into the slot and press straight down. Reinstall the screws at the back to secure the card and plug in the PCI Express power supply cable. As a general rule of thumb, any system build, even the most entry-level basic system, should have a minimum of one intake fan and one exhaust fan for cooling. Now unfortunately, this case only came with a single intake fan, and that's it. So I'm going to go ahead and install an additional fan in the back as an exhaust. This is going to help move air through the case and over the components and then exhaust it out the back. Just remember, after you install any fans, make sure you plug them into a fan header on the motherboard. And here's the entire system with all the hardware fully assembled. The only thing left to do before we test it out is put the side panels back on, and if you left any protective film on anything, go ahead and remove it now.
Now let's get this new system ready to go. Go ahead and plug in your monitor cable, a keyboard, and a mouse, and connect the power supply power cable at the back, and flip the switch to the on position. And now the big moment. Go ahead and press the power button. If you did everything right, your PC should have just turned on for the first time, and it's a good idea just to look inside and make sure your fans are spinning, especially the one on the CPU cooler. Since we don't have Windows installed yet, the system should boot into the BIOS screen. This is going to show you all sorts of different information about your computer, including the CPU you used, you should be able to see your RAM there, temperatures, you should see your fans that you installed, and all sorts of other information as well. If you're using compatible AMD hardware, you can enable a DOCP profile that'll automatically configure your RAM speeds and timings for maximum performance. And Intel users can do the same thing, but it's called XMP as opposed to DOCP. Now you can just hit the F10 key on your keyboard to save the changes and reboot the system, and then plug in your Windows installation media and go ahead and install Windows. And that's it. For anybody that just built their first PC, I want to say congratulations and I really hope that you gain the confidence to do it again sometime in the future. No more shopping for pre-built systems. We build our own PCs here from now on. Listen guys, thanks for watching. I really hope this video was helpful for you. If it helped you, please give it a thumbs up. I would really appreciate it. And also consider subscribing and coming back for more. There's a lot more useful content on the way. And we'll see ya.